Shalom Rav, uh, this session will be held in English and we have uh, three lectures at our program. <coughs> the first one will be held by Israel Charney, that is an American and Israeli who is widely known as a co-founder and past president of the International Association of Genocide Scholars, founder and first president of the Israel Family Therapy Association and a past president of the International Family Therapy Association. Three of his books have been awarded Outstanding Academic Book of the Year by the American Library Association, including the Encyclopedia of Genocide and Fascism and Democracy in the Human Mind. He had just received word that his book in Hebrew for the Open University series on genocide will be published in English in the US by Roman and Littlefield in the series on genocide, edited by Professor Alan Berger. The proposed title of the book in English is Could I, We the People Commit and Can Prevent Genocide? A book for learning about ourselves before. His lecture is entitled like that, a proposal for protocol for recording the factual events of mass killing before judgments are made. Israel, it's yours. Um, I know the word shalom. I have to remember how you say hello. Did everybody get a copy of the proposed model? Yes. Because I, Yair, can you help with that? Because that's what this is about. <coughs> it's a worksheet for describing and categorizing a genocidal event. And I think it has three new features to it. <coughs> One, as far as we know, it is the first systematic worksheet for assembling a wide range of empirical data about how any given genocidal event developed and unfolded and its outcomes. Two, the proposed methodology purposely postpones any effort at classification or categorization of an event, whether or not it is genocide, or whether the mass killings qualify as intentional genocide or as crimes against humanity or any of the many names that have now been offered and are in use for describing mass murders. Categorizing is postponed, that's in the methodology, until after a sufficient stage of assembly of factual data, which is what this worksheet is about has been assembled. What happens today, today means ever since the beginning of genocide studies, is that energies are poured into the categorization and even the collection of data about an event falls by the wayside, especially if it is one of the, and forgive me for the expression, smaller genocides, the less important, the unimportant, that don't really qualify along with the bigger events. The third innovation is that the process of categorization, when we do get to it, to assign it a definitional structure as to what kind of genocide, what kind of mass murder it was, f is made to be understood as an act of judgment by the researcher. And I hope that I have enough time for my final remark where I propose that in the course of doing a worksheet like this, which is purposely kept brief, that there be an extra page where every one of us as a researcher writes down in advance what our definition of genocide is, what our predetermined attitudes are so as a kind of control it's part of the scientific method. There is no such thing as purely objective data. There's relative objectivity, and there's the awareness of the role of the experimenter in relation to the data, and that even proved true in physics, and hence the suicide of a number of physicists when the theory of indeterminacy came into the world. Let's continue. Uh, the problem of arguing about whether something is genocide has been 
defined by one recent scholar as a prime cause of the paralysis in the international system in response to a number of mass murders, such as in Rwanda and Sudan. Uh, I am no less impressed and I am quite depressed and have been for years by the fact that the definitional squabbles and the turf power struggles and the egos among us acad academicians in so many cases results in the fact that we lose contact with the basic fact that we are talking about people who were murdered. We lose a sense of reverence. We are so caught up in our game. I believe these struggles are not only an expression of the eternal power problems of us human beings, but they are an anesthetic to feeling the genuine tragedy. I'd like to introduce you to the model itself. And if you have it, and I, I gather Yair went to save the day to bring back a number, uh, please accept my remarks as an introduction un until you get a copy in your hand. The <coughs> first part of the worksheet refers to genocidal intention. We certainly want to know the degree of intentionality that is seen in the process of bringing out a given murderous sequence, and whether the intent was to exterminate a total people or to kill a significant number of a designated group per the Genocide Convention in whole or in part, whether the killing culminated in a definitive outcome of masses of dead bodies but was nonetheless done without focused intentionality towards a specific identity group. For example, the indiscriminate killing of civilians in Syria in the course of the effort of the government to keep its power. The worksheet seeks to identify a variety of possibilities. I'll read off simply some of the titles uh, of the choices, but I want to make it clear now that a researcher is entirely free to record more than one choice. And as I will emphasize further, a researcher is entirely free to add another conceptualization. This is a worksheet open for revision, the contribution of each one of us as we struggle to give something to our field. Intentional genocide total, intentional genocide partial, implied or emergent intentionality of genocide, not intentional genocide, for example, genocide as crimes against humanity or manslaughter. Other concepts, so many have been introduced. Humanicide was introduced by an Israeli scholar who's not remembered, Leon Shelef. Democide has been introduced by R.J. Rummel. Atrocity crimes has been introduced by F Ambassador Sheffer, who's now a, a professor of law, as I recall, or in a law school. Highly violent societies is the phrase that was used by a researcher called Gerlich. Ethnic cleansing is another category, and one can speak about that at length. Genocide as a result of environmental or ecological destruction and abuse, short name ecocide, concept that I introduced in one of my papers years ago. Lemkin's broad sweeping concern with cultural genocide, which includes a whole variety, ethnocide, biological, physical, economic, linguicide that's forbidding a people to use their native language, uh, as uh, uh, was the case uh, um, in Turkey for the Kurds for a long time and also, as I recall, in Romania for Hungarians. Uh, other forms of genocidal intent, political, religious, ideological, but the, the, the list is not intended to be comprehensive. It's intended to invite the researcher to make a selection, 
in the course of organizing the data about an event. And the last category is one that I want to comment on a little more in the uh, types of genocide. And you're going to be, some of you will be a bit shocked. Uh, I call it killing for killing, killing's sake. In psychology, we have Eric Frum giving us years ago a concept that he called necrophilia. A few weeks ago in the New York Times, we have Thomas Friedman creating a fictional parable where the archetypal hero, Batman, is discussing the source and motivation of evil. He thought it was good sport because some men aren't looking for anything logical like money. They can't be bought, bullied, reasoned, or negotiated with. Some men just want to watch the world burn. And I, as a psychologist genocide researcher, have become more and more convinced, not that that covers the whole story by any means, but historical and political interpretations are not sufficient and there is a tremendous range of psychological contribution to these events. I, I, many of you know that right now at the Metropolitan Opera in New York, there is, in my opinion, a tragic shame of a, an opera that is called The Death of Klinghoffer. And there Mahmoud, who's the terrorist in charge, it was Arafat, uh, says that the day he and his enemies will sit peacefully and work towards peace is the day our hope dies, the day I shall die too. Now, I felt so ashamed before my late father that I'm giving a talk in English in Israel that I also brought a few lines from a poem that appeared in Musaf Sifrut a few weeks ago by Tuvia Rivner, and he speaks about this eternal tendency of us human beings. Habizayon hazel lehiyot chayat teref velalechet al shtaim. Ana, ana, hu metpalel. Ana, ana, habizayon hazel liktol velahargish sipuk kimo be'ahava. Ana, ana, hatzileinu. The next category in the worksheet is to identify the targeted victim group. And here again, we get complexity. Is it along the lines of racial identity, religious identity, ethnic identity, political affiliation, gender, sexual preference, membership in whatever collective group? Maybe it's belonging to Hapoel Yerushalayim, as opposed to Hapoel, <laughs> you know what, uh, or combinations of categories. Uh, years ago, I published a satire where I had Hitler and Stalin and Pol Pot and a few other chassidei umot ha'ulam yimach shmam go to an international legal firm for advice because the heat was growing in the world on them. And they went to a firm of lawyers that I named Satan, Hoor, and Conformist, Attorneys at Law. And one of the major advices that they gave in their consultation is never kill a single identified enemy. Go after people in some place where you have a wide variety of peoples, but your enemy is prominently among them. It'll be much harder to bring charges against you. Category three in the worksheet. You can s means of genocide. There is an endless number of ways to kill human beings, isn't there? And we're assembling data. That's what my presentation is about. We are not making judgments in this work about the kind of genocide it is. Not yet. Execution by hand or contact weapons. Death camps, concentration camps, gulags, labor camps forced marches, deportations, famine, attrition, medical killing, gas chambers, mass graves, bombing, saturation bombing, terrorist killing, bombs in transportation centers, in markets, in hospitals, in cemeteries, in the middle of funerals, 
rape. And the category that I and I'm sure many of you painfully worry about for the future, the use of weapons of mass destruction, and there's a whole variety of them that the brilliant human mind has created. The next category is context, organizing aims and themes, or I also call it inspiration, imagos. What makes Sammy run? What's, what's the God that he's celebrating in the course of killing other people? Religious supremacy, my God can beat up your God any time. Ethnic superiority, our people over alles. I always enjoy telling that at our home, the Kiddush on Erev Shabbat, the text that we sing is Ata Bechaltanu, Im Kol Ha'amim. Battles for ideological purity. Uh, Roger Semelin in Paris has given us a, a fine work emphasizing that concept recently. Economic system superiority. The longtime oil policies of the West that including, included shoring up latently totalitarian countries. And one should hardly overlook the prostitution of arms sales by all economic systems. I understand from a number of sources, although I do not present it as something that I know data-wise, that Israeli arms were very much implicated in the Rwandan genocide. For a long time, I have felt that the Israeli arms industry as a commercial industry that sells and sells is an absolute violation of all the values that I hold dear about what Israel, the Israel that I would like to have. I think there are other ways of creating an economic system and not putting it into the normal, we gotta sell in order to prove that the weapons work and to make money. Utopianism, war crimes against humanity in just wars and in unjust wars. Genocide that accompanies colonization globalization, ecological genocide, genocide that accompanies revolution, and on and on, the means of genocide, we are assembling data, uh, the, the context of genocide, forgive me, uh, that came right after the means of genocide. We have all of two categories to go before I make just a few remarks about making judgments. The identity of the perpetrator. When I was a kid, it was really simple. My father said, Hitler, uh, who was killing the Jews? A man called Hitler. There are perpetrators at all sorts of levels. There are also accomplices. There are also bystanders who play active roles in their passivity. Bystanders within a region where the genocide is taking place, bystanders outside a region. Theoretically, the world is now, has now earned a wonderful advance in the concept of right to protection, where another country, all other countries are obligated to intervene when there is mass killing and the country in which it's taking place does not have the will or it itself is a party to it. But it's a concept that has not yet really come to life for all that it received an incredible intellectual and political hoopla. Who are the perpetrators and accomplices and bystanders? Government, political parties, churches, revolutionaries, terrorists, the a victim people who are retaliating against their oppressor. Victim peoples can also commit genocide. Past victim people who are retaliating against their historic oppressor. The feeling of it is totally understandable, but let's get the facts. And the value judgment is a further step. Military executing the genocide, paramilitaries, police, special forces, the people doing the genocide, and a spontaneous outburst, data sheet, 
we assemble the information. The justification for recording is the backup of data and data sources as we all were trained in scientific method in our respective disciplines. As far as I know, there have been no collections of systematic data in all of our emerging genocide literature. There are many important contributions to understanding many facets. There are many global interpretations. I have not seen systematic data work. The outcome, ah, oh, there are so many ways of thinking about it. The numbers killed, but if they were a small people like the Herero, the numbers killed don't compare to the killings of a larger people. Well, what about the percentage of the group? In the Herero situation, it was probably around 90%. In the case of the Cambodians, where the United Nations took a few years before it agreed to call it an autogenocide, the percentage of the people gives you the information in a further powerful way than the number which is horrendous in its own right. The time span of the extermination, Rwanda's 100 days, wow, that's faster than I can write a paper for a journal. And there's room on the worksheet for specifying other important characteristics. Uh, the more, the merrier. That's what scholarship is about. The last part of the worksheet is a separate section. And it invites the researcher, every one of us, in our thinking, in our philosophy, to do two classifications. Classification one is in the language of the, political, the intellectual, political, and social sciences. Classification two, because they're different, is in the language of law. And I add to that the language of law varies with different legal systems, so it's not simply a monolithic thing. There's the emerging international law, there are the laws of different countries about genocide. Axis one, the classification in intellectual terms. Please make your choice, but it's your choice. This is intentional genocide. This is a de genocide with some degree of intentionality. This is ethnic cleansing. This is crimes against humanity. This is politicide, Barbara Harf's word. This is ecocide. This is mass murder targeted with indifferent randomness. This is cultural genocide, as Lemkin emphasized so much and we generally largely ignore, preventing births of a people. It is not a way of thinking where any researcher or any group have been endowed by God or by science to make the ultimate decision, yalla. It is related to the data, it is to be argued in relationship to the information, and it is open to the discussion of scholars, because that's the way science works best when you're trying to find a cure. And the last part is the classification of the legal degree of responsibility. Uh, I proposed in a talk that I gave at Yale University Law School years ago at something that I thrill at just in the memory, it was called the Raphael Lemkin Symposium on Genocide. I proposed something that I did not know, Amha Aritz, that the quite famous Wainwright, Wainwright? Churchill is, is the is the last name. What was his Ward first name? The Indian scholar. Ward Churchill. Ward Churchill. I can't hear what Ward, Ward Churchill. Ward, Ward Churchill. Ward. Ward. Okay, there was a Wainwright Churchill. He was the head of a psychoanalytic institute, Ellie. And that's what just got into my geriatric brain. Ward Churchill. Ward Churchill got in big trouble later on uh, for some very prejudicial statements. 
but he, he was a very powerful voice about the genocide of the Indians in North America and all over the American continent. And I did not know that he had made the same proposal, namely that we have in the legal system classifications of first degree genocide that are different from second degree genocide, that are different from third degree genocide in a way that is comparable to what is present in many law systems about homicide. There are different levels of intentionality, purposefulness, and they need to be recognized. Not that the third degree genocide is not important. I at no time wish that any of the assembly of data serve the purposes of minimization or denial of the human significance. And I conclude, the list continues with crimes against humanity, genocide as manslaughter, accomplices to genocide, attempted genocide, cultural genocide, no criminal responsibility. To repeat what I said at the beginning, if I have a moment at the end, I also suggest that every researcher add a page on which we self-identify to begin with. What's my definition of genocide? What are my politics in genocide studies? What are my attitudes and pre-existing values and principles? And let it sit there for me and for others who will see my work because that's one of the controls the scientific method offers us in a process that is complex and is not to be settled by fiat and by dictum. So, Dagobah.